My topic tonight is a father's love. We're talking about prayer tonight and tomorrow. I think back to many, many years ago, probably pretty close to 60 years ago, when our family was spending a week at Belmar, New Jersey for a summer vacation. And the oldest in the family, my brother Phil, and I, who am second, were having a wonderful time jumping in those little waves in the shallow part. But my brother Dave was scared. He was two or three. And uh, my father did, did his best every day that week to persuade Davy to come into the ocean with him and go out to the part where there were waves that he could jump. And my father promised him faithfully that he would make sure that he was held strongly and that the waves would not sweep over him. But Davy flatly and vociferously refused. And my father didn't force him. But on the last day of our vacation, Davy gave in and relented and asked to be taken to jump in the waves. Well, he was so ecstatic having more fun than he had ever had in his life, that his first reaction was to break into a loud wail of dismay. And he said, but we're going home this afternoon. Why didn't you make me go in? Now, what does that have to do with prayer? I hope you'll see that it has a very great deal to do with prayer, because what I would like to get at tonight is him to whom we pray. Who is it that we come to? Is it a father likely to do us in somehow? Is he a remote patriarch sitting up there somewhere in the ether, looking down over the parapets of heaven, perhaps, trying to find somebody who's having a good time so that he can say, cut it out. People do have hideous ideas of God. And the ordeal of fear, which my brother Dave was experiencing, prevented him from believing in the love of his father. Now, the only reason my father was interested in getting Dave out there into the waves was because my father loved him and he knew how much fun it would be for a little boy if the little boy could only trust his father. But he didn't trust him. He was scared to death of the waves and afraid. He doubted that his father was really strong enough to preserve him and to keep him from harm in the ocean. And a primitive, but I'm afraid very widespread idea of prayer is that there is somebody up there who's powerful and who could conceivably, maybe possibly, do what I want. And the great question is, can I get him to do what I want? Can I twist his arm, this reluctant deity, so far away? Can I persuade him to change his mind? And in our desperation, we pray, having tried everything else. Well, at least it's worth a try, isn't it? Now, I'm sure there are many in this room that have gone way beyond that primitive idea, and yet, and yet, there are times when that idea still lurks in the backs of our minds, when, especially in our situations of greatest desperation, when we feel that there really isn't any possibility that God is going to do anything about it. How do we view this father? Do we think of him really as a father at all? And in this day and age, we have to stop and acknowledge the fact that there are many people who have really never known a true earthly father. Perhaps they've known a father in the technical sense of the word, but he was not a true father. He was not a father in the sense that fathers are meant to be, and he was not a loving father. But C.S. Lewis has pointed out that even those who have never had any experience of a father's love have an idea of what a father's love ought to be, and that is why they feel deprived. 
We couldn't possibly feel deprived unless we had some norm, some notion of what true fatherly love ought to be. Now, where did we get that notion? Well, we read in Ephesians, the third chapter, that from him, from God, all earthly fatherhood is named. And when we come to him in prayer, we need to learn to come as a little child to a father who loves us beyond the love that any earthly father has ever been able to demonstrate. A love which even earthly fathers who adore their children cannot adequately imagine. It's way beyond that. A deeper love, an eternal love, an unchangeable love. And it it is he to whom we come. So if there are any who are trying to follow what I'm saying here and would would like a few things to put down on paper, let me tell you that there are three things that I want to say about the purpose of prayer. And the first is that it is to discover the character of God primarily. It is not mainly to get what we want out of God. It is to learn who he is, to discover his character. We have these vague notions, very popular misconceptions, and sometimes we feel that when we come to God in prayer, we have to come feeling very pious and very religious. Well, I confess to you that you're not looking at a woman who feels very pious ever, and certainly not usually in prayer do I feel religious or very spiritual. I pray because I know that I need to pray in a sense for the same reason that I sit at my desk and answer letters or go down to the kitchen and wash the dishes or do the laundry. I do them because they need to be done. And prayer is the Christian's vital breath, as one hymn writer has put it. Prayer is a necessity. And so when we pray, we are learning The more we pray, the more we begin to discover the character of God. He is not a reluctant deity. He is not remote. He is not somewhere way out there and inaccessible to us. He is closer to us than breathing and nearer than hands and feet, to quote another hymn writer. Now, it does take, for most of us, an ordeal of some sort, an ordeal of faith, fear, doubt, before we begin to enter into the deeper aspects of of prayer. Now, my brother Dave's fear was the fear of destruction by this powerful ocean. And just last week, we had an unforgettable demonstration of the power of the ocean along the East Coast. You may have heard, read about the storms. My husband and I live right on the ocean in the coast of Massachusetts. And the entire coast of our state was declared a disaster area. It was the worst storm in more than 100 years. And in our little town, we saw seawalls destroyed that have stood for 100 years. And the road where my husband and I normally take our afternoon walk has great chunks taken out of it. The macadam was lifted straight out of the road and flung 100 yards up onto people's lawns and steel Guardrails were yanked right out of their sockets, twisted like a piece of tin foil, and thrown 50 yards or so. One house was demolished on that same road, and our next door neighbors had their stairs eaten away by the ocean, and two houses over, a poor man that had spent most of the summer carrying wheelbarrow loads of dirt to fill in some of the rocks between his lawn and, and the lower rocks, and this was quite high above the ocean. He had also had a retaining wall built. The retaining wall went very quickly, and of course, not only all his wheelbarrow loads, but about 20 more feet of his lawn went too. So it was absolutely spectacular to watch that storm. Waves, the like of which I've never seen, about 40 to 50 feet high. And uh, the thundering, the roaring, the shuddering of our house was wonderful. And I read in Psalm 93, it just happened to be in my reading last week, and it said, the seas have lifted up, the seas have lifted up 
O Lord, their voice, the seas have lifted up their pounding waves, mightier than the thunder of the great waters, mightier than the breakers of the sea. The Lord on high is mighty. And as long as we've lived on the ocean, we could not have imagined the power of the breakers of the sea when we saw rocks that weighed as much as a ton flung by the water up onto the road. Now that it's the Lord who's in charge of all that, who with one word could have calmed those waves. And it's he who holds us in his arms, in the everlasting arms. And you and I are loved with an everlasting love. That's what the Bible says. And underneath are the everlasting arms. In my brother's refusal to surrender to his father's arms and thus find the joy that my father wanted him to find, he was miserable for the whole week, watching his brother and sister having a great time in the waves, wishing with all his heart that he had the courage to do that, not trusting his father and trusting that the waves would destroy him. And so it is with our loving Father in heaven. He reaches out his arms to us and he says, trust me. I will hold you. I do know what I'm doing. Trust me. And when we come to him in prayer, we've got to believe that he is trustworthy. And we learn more and more as we pray that he does love us, that he never breaks his word. We need to discover his character. And of course, it was a great lesson for that little boy, two or three years old. He learned a lesson in trust of his father's word, but it had to be through the ordeal of doubt and fear. fear. Now you remember the story in Exodus 14 of the children of Israel facing the sea in front of them and the thundering chariots of Egypt closing in from behind. And they were terrified. It was a situation of desperation. And you remember that God asked Moses' cooperation, as he did in virtually every miracle he performs in in all the Bible, There's almost invariably something that some human being has to do in order for God to work. And he tells Moses to raise his staff and stretch out his hand over the sea. Now, can anything be more uh, feeble and useless than one human hand over the sea? But another lesson in prayer is that when we're praying, we're asking God to do what we can't do. And very often, God puts his finger on something we can do. And he says, you take care of that, I'll take care of the rest. And here I am, an old lady, still learning the lesson that God will always do what needs to be done if I can't do it. But he always expects me to do what I can do. And so he gives me the privilege to work in cooperation with him. And I don't know any more significant and important aspect of that cooperation between a man or a woman and God than the work of prayer. And we'll be looking into that a little bit more. But anyway, this wonderful story, the, he stretches out his hand and raises the staff and the waters roll back and the children of Israel go through on dry ground and the Egyptians attempt to follow them and they are all swamped and drowned. And in the song of victory that they sing in Exodus 15, it is a recognition of the character of God. This miracle that was performed for their salvation and their rescue, opened their eyes to who God was. And they sing of the Lord as their strength, salvation, my God, a warrior, 
majestic in power, uh, in the greatness of your majesty, you threw down those who opposed you. You unleashed your burning anger. It consumed them like stubble. You blew with your breath and the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who among the gods is like you, O Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, so working wonders? You stretched out your hand and the earth swallowed them. In your unfailing love, you will lead the people you have redeemed. I hadn't trusted him very much before this. They're declaring that they're going to trust him a little bit more now. They didn't do too well at that either, did they? So much like us. But God wants us to learn that he is trustworthy, that he does love us. Well, the second lesson of prayer, important lesson, is to surrender myself to that love. Now my father could have forced my little brother to go into the water with him. That much he could have done. He certainly could have very easily carried him out there screaming and kicking. But he could not force the child to relax and find the joy that he really wanted to give him. So it was not to his purposes to force the child to do the thing. That wasn't what he was after. He was after giving the child joy. Do you get the lesson? Does it ring any bells? How many of us could testify? I'm sure there are dozens, hundreds perhaps tonight, who could testify to a time when you absolutely were going through an ordeal of doubt about God. You could not imagine what God could possibly do about something that you were in desperation about. And God did exceedingly abundantly above all that you asked or thought, and you look back and you think, why didn't I surrender long before? What stupidity. What thick-headedness. And what else is new? Jesus said to the disciples, fools and slow of heart to believe. Have I been so long time with you, and yet you have not known me? I need to learn to surrender myself to that love. Now, Adam and Eve made a choice way back in the Garden of Eden. It was between God's word and Satan's word. God's word says, do this and you will live. But if you do that, one thing which he had forbidden, you will die. And Satan comes along and says, in effect, exactly the opposite. If you eat the forbidden fruit, you will live. You'll do better. You can upgrade your lifestyle. God is trying to cheat you out of the one thing that is really going to make you happy. And so they chose to believe Satan. Now, what is evil? What is the essence of of evil. It is the repudiation of our dependence upon God and the insistence upon becoming like God. We were not made to be gods. We were made to be men and women. But when we refuse that, we are doing exactly what Adam and Eve did, believing the great lie. Did God say? Do you really think God loves you? God is trying to cheat you. And in one form or another, Satan comes to us every day with the same old lie. And when we believe him, then we are repudiating our dependence upon God. In other words, sin is a declaration of independence. I am my own. I'm going to do my thing. i got to be me. And that's what they did. And the result, of course was disaster, death, destruction, and sin. And the only way in which that essential evil can be overcome is by reversing that movement. And instead of repudiating God and refusing his way, surrendering ourselves to it. And so we're back to the little boy in the ocean with the father. The joy will come only through surrender. 
one of my favorite verses in the Old Testament is in Second Chronicles 29, 27. And I'm not really sure whether it's First or Second Chronicles at this point, but the verse is, when the burnt offering began, the song of the Lord began also. And that puts sacrifice and joy together. Surrender, the utter giving over of my life, my will, myself, my all to God. That is what brings joy, and that was what barred my brother from having the fun that the rest of us were having throughout that week's vacation. The only escape from misery and self-love is self-giving. Surrender. Now, you know, this is a hard saying in today's world because we live in an atmosphere totally preoccupied with the self. Aren't you just about up to here with self-esteem and self-image and self-actualization and self-fulfillment and self-this and self-that and self-the-other thing? I couldn't tell you how many letters I get in the mail telling me that telling me all about these problems and then of course the last page says but I've always had such a poor self-image and it all goes back to that. Well in one sense I want to write back to that person and say well if you have a poor self-image that is an accurate assessment because the Bible tells us that all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags and we are poor and wretched and miserable and blind and naked. And we certainly ought to have a poor self-image. I mean, it ought to be, to use a crude word, lousy. But that's not the end of God's story. Why should we have a poor self-image? Well, it's an accurate assessment because we are not true men and women. God wants us to be true men and women, and the true man and the true woman is one who has declared his or her dependence on the God who made them and returned back in surrender to him. So we need to accept the fact that there's plenty of room for improvement. If we compare ourselves with other people, we're likely to come up with a very inaccurate assessment because there will be a lot of people that we think are much worse than we are and therefore we're open to pride, that feeds our pride, and then there are a whole lot of people that we think are a whole lot better than we are, and that also feeds our pride, because we feel that we got a poor hand of cards, and we really deserved better than that, and that person really didn't deserve it as well as I did, and so poor little me, I was behind the door when they gave out all the gifts. The one principle of hell is, as C.S. Lewis puts it, I am my own. And the principle of heaven is, I am thine, thy will be done. So prayer teaches me as I begin to receive God's refusals, and God's refusals may be his greatest mercies, it teaches me to give over more and more my will to his, to surrender myself to his love knowing that his will is always love. His will is always love. Sometimes when I tell some of the stories of, of my own life and my experiences on the mission field and various things that happened, which were certainly not according to my tastes and preferences, not on my blueprint of the way things were supposed to work in a missionary's life, I have young people come up to me and say, but Mrs. Elliot, you know, when you talk about the will of God, I mean, really, it's, it's just really kind of, you know, I mean, like, scary. <laughs> and I say, well, why is it scary? Well, but what if God did to me what he did to you? <laughs> and I can only say to them, everything God ever did to me, he did for me. And I can look back now and say, thank you, Lord. You have loved me with an everlasting love. And the only way that I can perceive the truth of that love is through surrender. And so my prayer is an opportunity daily 
to surrender myself. Which brings me to the theme that really is going to run through all three of these talks, which is the Lord's Prayer. And I trust that at least the Presbyterians here would be able to say the Lord's Prayer from memory, and probably many more of you too. But the, the, the first few phrases in the Lord's Prayer put us in the proper relationship with God. We start with the Our Father, accepting the fact that I am a child, just a little ignorant, silly child, like that poor little ignorant boy on the beach. I don't know any more about the fun that I'm missing than that little kid. I don't know, shall we say, beans about the joy that God wants to give me because I don't trust him. But I come now and I say, our father, my father, here I am, your child, coming to you in prayer. And what a privilege, what a thrill. What, isn't it a wonderful thing that I can come? I can just come to him. And then it says, our father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And I won't go into all that's involved there. Obviously, we haven't got nearly enough time, but let's think about those two phrases, thy kingdom come and thy will be done which fit very neatly under my third thing that I want to mention about learning the Father's love. Prayer is, number one, to discover the character of God, number two, to surrender myself to his love, and number three, to participate in his redemptive work. Prayer is participation in God's redemptive work here in this world. And that's what we're here for. You know, we're really worth absolutely nothing except to God and to other people. We are worthless. And I was glad that we sang that beautiful hymn that I love so much, Beneath the Cross of Jesus, but it always just kills me when I find that these modern hymn books have watered it down. And this is one of them. The, my favorite stanza of the four and there were only three in this book, was left out. O oh, safe and happy shelter, O oh, refuge tried and sweet. O oh, trysting place where heaven's love and heaven's justice meet. As to the holy patriarch a wondrous dream was given, so seems my Savior's cross to me, a ladder up to heaven. And then the last word in the hymn in the original version, is my own worthlessness. This hymn book has made it my unworthiness, which is not nearly as bad as my own worthlessness. But ladies and gentlemen, we really are worthless, except to God and to other people. We're here not for ourselves. We are not our own. We're here for the sake of of the world. And one of the things that God has called us to do is to pray, to pray for the world, to pray for anybody whose path we cross. We're not talking in vague generalities. Now, for years, I rattled off the Lord's Prayer because this was what my father ended our family prayers with every morning. He herded all of us children together after breakfast and sat us down in the living room and we sang a hymn together and then he read the Bible to us and then we knelt and he led us in prayer and then we prayed the Lord's Prayer. And it didn't mean anything. We just rattled it off the way your children can rattle off those commercials that they see on TV. They haven't the slightest idea what the product is and they couldn't care less, but they can tell you every word. And I remember we learned all the commercials on the radio back in those days. I can remember Use Ajax, the foaming cleanser, fo floats the dirt, bum, 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 right down the drain, bum, 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 bum. Is there anybody here old enough to have heard, ever heard that? No, nobody here as old as I am, but we knew all those commercials, and Chiquita Banana, and I come to say, bananas have to ripen in a certain way. Well, the Lord's Prayer was like that to us, and I can remember my brother, Phil always said trespasses instead of trespasses, and I used to puzzle over the word trespasses because I remembered seeing a little sign on somebody's grass that said no trespassing, and I thought that trespassing meant walking on people's grass, and I never walked on anybody's grass, so I didn't see why I had to say that every day. 
But the older I get, the more I see that that prayer includes everything. Remember, it was the disciples who had been walking and talking most intimately with Jesus for those three years. They were the ones who walked with him day and night and ate with him and slept with him and heard his words firsthand and surely heard him pray because we have some of his prayers recorded in the Gospels. And yet they were the ones that they, they must have recognized a tremendous difference between the way he prayed and the way they were used to praying. So they said, Lord, teach us to pray. And what did he do? He didn't give them a sermon. He didn't give them a treatise on prayer. He gave them a very simple prayer. These very words. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. And it, as I say, the older I get, the more I see that this just embraces everything that I can possibly want to pray about. And I can fill those words with whatever meaning happens to be the things that I'm praying about at the time. And they are generalities, aren't they? I think one of the things that I found difficult in my early years of using that prayer when I did become a teenager and began thinking seriously about the words I thought, but there's such vague generalities. How in the world am I ever going to know whether God's kingdom is coming and what do I have to do with it? And what, how can I know whether his will is being done on earth as it is in heaven? Earth is too vast. And of course, in the later phrases, it gets down to very, very personal things. But I was thinking just this week, um, thy kingdom come, that involves many more things than could possibly fit into our imagination. The ocean with its tides, the storms, the waves, the winds, the birds that we see from our windows, the leaves, the moonlight, the moonlight on the sea is such a beautiful sight. All of these things are a part of God's earth a part of his kingdom. I don't know what the redemption of all this creation is going to mean, but we know that creation is going to be redeemed. And it waits on tiptoe, Romans 8 tells us, for the fulfillment, the adoption of sons. And creation groans. And I think about this when I see animals suffer and I see uh, a dead bird or something. I think of how creation groans waiting for the adoption of us who are the sons of God. And just this last week, apropos of the storm, I heard on TV some fascinating stuff and I wished I'd written some of it down because I've forgotten most of it now, but the man was talking about how volcanoes and earthquakes and storms and hurricanes are absolutely necessary to the survival of the planet. We feel as though they are disasters, and of course, human beings die and suffer losses of all kinds. But he said that the volcanoes have a great deal to do with keeping the temperature even on the earth, and the storms and earthquakes actually have something to do with the balance of um, carbon dioxide. And so I thought, here's a perfect spiritual illustration. Storms are necessary to our lives. So when I pray, thy kingdom come, I don't know what volcanoes, figurative or literal, might, might, be, might be necessary in God's answer to my prayer. It's infinitely greater. And yet, in my individual life and in the lives, lives of the people for whom I pray, I can say, thy kingdom come. And I can be in a very profound and beyond my understanding sense, participating in the work of God. That's what prayer is about. I am participating and given that privilege. In Exodus, back to that passage in Exodus 14, 
um, the story of Israel going through the sea. In verse 20, or verse 19, it says, The angel of God, who had been traveling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to the one side and light to the other. A picture of God's dealings. So often they bring darkness to one side and light to the other, and when we happen to be on the dark side, we're saying, I don't see how Romans 8.28 has anything to do with this. I don't see how in the world this could possibly fit into God's pattern for good. Well, we don't have to see it. We just have to believe it. And the scripture has told us that this is true. We know that it is true. We don't know how it is true. I don't know what storms and volcanoes you may be suffering in your personal life tonight. I don't know anybody in this room except my husband and Nancy. But there may be storms on one side or dark on one side. But just remember that God is bringing about in answer to the prayers of his holy church throughout all the world since 2,000 years ago. He's bringing about the coming of his kingdom. And the church has been praying that prayer. And to me, it's a thrilling thing to realize that when I pray that prayer, I am simply adding my voice to the tremendous chorus of prayer all over the world. Every minute of every hour of every day, people are praying. And I believe they're probably praying that very prayer. There's never a time when they're not. Another great hymn, the day thou gavest, Lord, is ended, has a stanza, as o'er each continent and island the dawn brings on another day. The voice of prayer is never silent, nor die the strains of praise away. Isn't that marvelous to think of that? Participation in the work of God, in his redemptive work. I pray thy will be done. And I understand why the college student says to me, but that's scary, because there are times when I tremble. Sometimes it causes me to tremble when I pray that prayer for my grandchildren. It will cost them a great deal, eventually, if the will of God is to be perfected in them, because it takes the path of suffering for us to learn to know what sacrificial love is about. But what do I want for the child more than anything else in the world? His joy, his fulfillment. And I know that there is no other way but the will of God. There is no other way. And so I pray, thy will be done. And it may cost me something. And I continue to pray, thy will be done. Because I believe with all my heart that God's will is purest love. He is love. That is his nature. And so his power, his wisdom, his strength, his justice, these are all attributes. But every one of them is synonymous with his love. That his power is shown in his love. His love is shown in his power, whether we see it or not, whether we understand it or not. And his justice is absolutely one with his love. They are not standing in opposition to each other. So my life can be rightly ordered only when my paramount objective is beyond this life up there. When my paramount objective is an eternal one. Then I can pray with all my heart, thy will be done. Because then I know that I'll never have to worry about self-image and self-esteem and self-actualization. It will be total fulfillment. And I read in my Bible that God's ultimate purpose for all of us is fulfillment. In Christ 
all creation finds its perfection and fulfillment. We read in the book of Ephesians. And the result is joy and peace. In the first chapter of Ephesians, we have Paul's, one of Paul's great prayers. He says, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Now, what does Paul pray for the Ephesian Christians? I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of the glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power. It's just as if Paul is desperately casting about for the greatest superlatives that he can think of here. His incomparably great power for us who believe that that power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly realms far above all rule, authority, power, and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. And there's that wonderful prayer in the third chapter. I haven't got time to read all of that either, but he, he prays specifically that they may know the measure of the love of God, that you may be able to grasp how wide and long and deep and high is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Now that's a prayer to pray for anybody for whom you don't know what to pray. And most of the people on my list, I don't know what to pray for. I really, I don't know what Lars's greatest need is. I always know one or two things to pray for, specifically for Lars, but I don't know what his greatest need is. Only God knows that. And so my responsibility as a wife to pray for my husband is to participate in the work of God in this man participate in the work of God in all those for whom God has given us perfectly uh, legitimate concern, be they neighbors, friends, or people we've never seen before. The, the result of surrender is peace. God's ultimate purpose for us is joy. In Psalm 119, verse 124, we read, deal with your servant according to your love. Now there's another expression of that wonderful phrase, thy will be done. Why should we be afraid? If his will is done, he will deal with me according to his love. And who can ask for anything more? The great lesson of prayer is that God loves us and he waits for us to come to him as a trusting child. God bless you.